Guys, I just wanted to say that we are absolutely blessed to have Stan Efferding on the show. He's an IFBB pro, he's a powerlifting champion, and he is also, like at the moment, his vertical diet book is number one on Amazon three weeks in a row. Go Stan. And yes, he's the author of The Vertical Diet, who, if you don't know, all the people that I look up to in the fitness industry in terms of who I love, respect, follow, listen, um, seek wisdom and knowledge from, all love and rave on about the vertical diet. And we talk about it quite a lot in this podcast. So it's just absolutely fantastic. Like, you know, what is the vertical diet? We'll teach you how to get vertical in this podcast. And I was just, man, we we were absolutely so blessed to have Stan on the show today. Like he just ran through all of these different practical tools, resources, tips that you can use and integrate into your daily life, into your routine. And I hope that he convinces you and motivates you to, to be better and make better choices. There was just some fantastic stuff in here. So make sure you listen to the podcast the entire way through because he didn't stop. There was just nonstop, really good information. So put your thinking caps on and get ready to go for an absolute ride because this was fantastic. And without any um, further ado, guys, please like, share, and subscribe this video. Like literally your likes, shares, and subscribe have increased um, this podcast driving up the charts, which is like quite fantastic. And you know, when we crack the um, under a hundreds is when it starts gets like really recognized, which is fantastic. So, and the, the best way to do that is if you're listening on Apple podcasts is please go to Apple podcasts and just scroll down to like go to Corey Batwell podcast, scroll down to the bottom and, and leave a review. That would be the best thing ever. And I'd love to hear what you guys think about this podcast. So please send me a message or if you're watching on YouTube, like put a comment down. I'd love to have a chat and see what you think about it. See what you actually integrate into your daily life. And if you're interested in optimizing yourself, becoming the best version of you, and you're like an entrepreneur and you want, want really want to start focusing on yourself and investing in yourself and learning about yourself and, and becoming like you know an elite version specimen, you can head to my website, coreyboutwell.com, and there's a free quiz which sort of helps you get clear on exactly that. So I would definitely encourage you to go through and give that a bit of a whirl. If you're interested in working with me, just head onto Instagram. You can DM me coach, or you can just send me a message. I'd love to have a chat about, you know, you and we can set up a, a, st- a free strategy call essentially within 15, 20 minutes. I'll just give you a whole bunch of stuff to figure you out, set up a whole, uh, set up an awesome free strategy for you, for you to execute on and, you know, create a better life for yourself, which is just fantastic. Also, if you wondered how I got into a pro status in fitness competitions and did it naturally through focusing my energy at the gym and and created a body that I'm extremely proud of and confident in, I have a training course and a training program. It's for those people who have had some experience in the gym and they're ready to take it to the next level. And if you DM me on Instagram program, we can get started on that. And also, if you're just interested and want to know what's in the program, send me a message on Instagram. I'm happy to have a chat about that as well. That course is quite awesome. I'm getting some great feedback on that. And people are just really like starting to, you know, start to really take on the term execution style focused training, which I'm just absolutely loving. The feedback on that is fantastic. And also in terms of my own recipes, my own diet, I did some research on basically it scattered every single best ingredient for carbs, fats, proteins, and and micronutrients. And I researched all of these ingredients and I was like, cool, I want to start eating these ingredients. What do I do? So I created, well, I had to figure out a whole bunch of recipes in terms of meal prep, how to use different bone broths, how to mix certain things together, make them taste good. And I created a recipe ebook and you can get that clicking down on the links below. Obviously, I just mentioned bone broth. I love bone broth and you can get 12% off of bone broth and the best stuff is the goo. It's a little bit better than the powder. You can get this real good goo bone broth, which has way more minerals, nutrients, omega-3s and and all these good healthy fats and mm, 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 good stuff in there. And best of the bone, I believe, is the best for that. And you can click down the link below and get yourself 12% off. So good. And obviously, Stan talks about using in this podcast a lot of bone broth and Best of the bone, bone broth is the best bone broth. <laughs> like for sure, it's Australian grass-fed cows and the bone broth's cooked over a slow 72-hour method. So it's literally like the best. And 
Of course, this podcast is brought to you and is sponsored by Eternum Labs. And Eternum Labs' mission is to get out there and help people live the longest, perform at their best, and be in their best energy and their best body and their best mind. And essentially, we have a whole bunch of products which are just absolutely fantastic for that. One of them is Apigenin. And what Apigenin does, it's a super anti-aging product. And it, it essentially like removes the enzyme which breaks down all of the anti-aging molecules in our body so it removes that so it's super um, anti-aging increasing so it helps us our our anti-aging molecules stay consistent and high for a whole life how good is that and that's like a chamomile and a parsley extract apigenin is like amazing and it helps you have a really good sleep so i highly recommend looking at that we also have a whole range of different products including like lion's mane we have nmn resveratrol glutathione we have all these really good products so i highly suggest having a little bit of a look at those you can go to eternumlabs.com.au use the discount code corey c-o-r-e-y and you can pick yourself up a good little batch of those good things so without any further ado guys oh, i'm so excited for you guys to listen to this podcast let's have a whole bunch of fun especially because we get to talk talk to these like-minded people who are just want to live the best life and want to, you know, just do all the good things and just spread love and the good message and the, and, and the good energy as well. So thank you for listening. Please like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you in the next one. Stan Everding, you're on in Las Vegas airport, stuck at the moment. Flights <laughs> are delayed. <laughs> Thanks for jumping onto the podcast. No problem, my friend. Yeah, I am. I'm in the airport. I'm in the, uh, uh, just here chilling in one of the chairs so we might hear some audio in the background no big deal that's all right we'll we'll do it best as we can if anything happens i'll i'll say some stuff but thank we you sh- man. Thank we you. should be all good so what have just before we start get stuck into it what are some lessons that you have learned recently which you think are really beneficial for people to know well most importantly for busy folks who are trying to train uh i just have to be really organized particularly with my meals probably have heard me talk ad nauseum about the fact that I'm always packing my meals with me. I take these little hot thermos and uh, I'm just coming back from Albuquerque now. But if I make, if I take longer trips, I just take more thermos. When I went to Russia, I had five thermos in my bag so I could eat every four hours. And it was a 20 hour day, you know, to, before between the layover and, and uh, customs and all that stuff. But uh, that's probably the, the biggest thing. And it, we also know from research, it's the, it's the single most important uh, method of complying with the diet is just meal prep in general, whether of course I own a meal prep company, but, uh, you know, whether you make your own or you buy from someone else, when I travel, I, I always take my food with me and it's less stress too, because I don't have to worry about having to find something. <laughs> so I got you back there. Then I don't have to worry about finding something at the airport or eating room service. And, and you just feel like shit all the time. You get brain fog and diarrhea and, you know, it, it just, it's just nasty some of the food that is served out there so, <laughs> so uh, i can eat what i want when i want it's my food that i prepared and that's probably the biggest thing and if i stay for a longer period of time i just pack more meals into a rolling coleman cooler and i pop it on the airplane and take it with me bada bing bada boom <laughs> yeah and that's just time saving i save money i save time i'm just more organized i'm less stressed just little things like that yeah you feel good you're healthier. You got all of those yeah. things. Yeah. And also, you know, when I'm when I'm busy, I have to I just have to be uh, uh, more strategic about my workouts. And so I'll you know, I just go in and do like I'll superset chest and back and I can get in and out in twenty five minutes uh, most of the time and I do the same thing when superset you know, quads and hammies and you don't always have the amount of time that you want, but you could still get an adequate volume in to get a really good hypertrophy response. I mean, even at my age with with all the traveling that I'm doing, uh, you know, I'm able to get great workouts that are sufficient, not just to maintain, but even to make gains if I desire. Yeah. Yeah. And for someone like you, you just look fantastic as well. So <laughs> I would say is a question, um, for people, like, what would you say to people who are a little bit resistant to meal prepping and eating healthy food? They're like, Oh yeah, I could, but oh yeah, this, but what would you sort of say to those people to encourage them to, to get onto the train? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I had a business partner who was significantly overweight and he traveled a lot and he didn't have the opportunity to meal prep. Uh, and so 
he came down and stayed with me for a month. Uh, he just got an Airbnb in town in Vegas and he flew down from Seattle and we ate out every single meal. We went to the airport and ate, we went, we ordered room service. We went to hotels. Uh, every single meal was ordered out and he lost 20 pounds in 30 days simply because I instructed him which choices to make. So you, you, if you, if you, if you're smart about it, if you try, you can choose the right offerings, the right menu items to get you the results you want. Here's a, a quick tip for that. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you a little story on John, Johnny Jones. You know, I'm down training Johnny Bones Jones, UFC light heavyweight champion in Albuquerque. It's been a lot of my travel lately. I've been back and forth there for the last five months and probably going to still be training him for the next seven months. And, uh, you know, meals was one of the big things that I do. And of course we work out every day, but, um, he's trying to put on mass when you see more food. We want it to be lean mass. And so, uh, but he doesn't like eating the same thing all the time. And he, he still likes to, you know, go out and shoot guns and take his dogs and take the family out. So he isn't stuck on a regimen as much as I would prefer, of course. And plus we're seven months out. So, uh, you know, he really doesn't get really strict until about three or four months out before the fight. So for the time being, I just, uh, I just pulled up the menus of all the restaurants that he might frequent and that includes McDonald's and, and uh, Chick-fil-A and, uh, you know, you name it. I just did a search of all the restaurants near his home or near where he was going. And here's what I looked for when I pulled up the menus. I looked for a two to one protein to fat ratio. If I can get 40 grams of protein and 20 grams of fat, that's a good meal to run with. And that, that's a good, you know, other than calories, second to cal only to calories, that's a macro content that I think is sufficient uh, for a healthy individual, an active individual if they want to improve performance. And that's kind of the, the bottom line for me. And I picked out those menu items and I snapshot them and I sent them to them and said, Hey, if you want to eat at McDonald's, here's what you eat. If you want to eat it at uh, Chick-fil-A, here's what you eat. And, uh, and he has those in his phone. And if he wants to go there, that's what he can choose. That's just insane. I love that. And I love how like easy it makes for someone as well. Stan, there's been so many people that like I look up to and I respect who have tried the vertical diet and have jumped on board and they've either tried it for six months or a year. That was the initial trying period. And then they've just gone, well, I'm going to stick to this. <laughs> like Juju Mufu, War Plays War Days, like those guys. They're just yeah. sticking to it the whole time, man. I think it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it becomes a lifestyle. It's just, and I don't think it's magic. I, I've said that. That's, that's on the first page of the book. It's not magic. Uh, it's just a lot of little tips and tricks that I learned over the years because I had particularly difficult digestive issues throughout my career. Uh, mainly as a result of seed oils. I'm allergic to them. Uh, but uh, you know, with that, I started to learn to be a little more choosy. And I made the, the quote, you know, I don't eat foods I like. I eat foods that like me. And I make that decision about an hour after I eat. And after a while, you start to like the foods that like you because you know you're going to feel great. You're not going to be bloated and gassy and you're going to go to the gym and you're not going to have a shark in the middle of a squat. You know, <laughs> those kinds of things. That, that makes a big difference, you know, when you can go train and, and your stomach feels good. So, I think people just, they, they get used to the kinds of foods that make them feel good. And then, and then those become their, their preferable choices. And they start to identify once you, once you discover how good you feel and then you stray, I always say you stray, you pay, uh, you, you start to realize that certain foods were, were really doing a number on you. And then you, you tend to avoid those. Uh, and not because it's not a good food, bad food conversation necessarily, and uh, people, it's individualistic and dose dependent. You know, people have different reactions to different foods. I just try to get them to pay attention to those. And I, I kind of found a, made the foundation off of, uh, you know, low gas foods. I refer to the FODMAP menu, the fermentable oligodye monosaccharides and polyols. I just, I get them to pay a little bit of attention to the foods that we know from research uh, uh, can, can kind of wreak havoc uh, in certain quantities and, under, and prepared in certain ways. Uh, that, uh, that people tend to, to just feel uncomfortable with. And I saw that firsthand. This isn't, you know, this is something I, I came to the research later. I saw that firsthand. I've been training, you know, bodybuilders and powerlifters since the late eighties, including women in particular were the ones that suffered the most stress because they were told to eat those kinds of egg white, broccoli, tilapia diets. And, and they, you know, you'd go backstage at a 
bodybuilding show and, and it was miserable back there. It was, you couldn't, that's where we needed those masks, really, to be honest with you. Not, not with COVID, but backstage at a, at a bodybuilding show. And so I, I just, my athletes didn't, you know, they didn't have those problems. They didn't, they didn't suck down a lot of protein powders and egg whites and broccoli. So they weren't walking around in a gas storm all the time. And what's funny is, is that when I did have athletes that would eat like that, their significant other would tell me how miserable it was to exist with them because of how bad they stunk all the time. So, uh, and I'm not saying the gas is a bad thing. It's not unhealthy uh, for you, I suppose. It might be for everyone around you, uh, but you just feel better, you know, by making the choices that I suggest. And, uh, so you're right. I think, I think people, they, they just enjoy how they feel on the diet. And after a while, they just don't really call it a diet. Those are just the foods that they choose as part of their lifestyle that make them feel good. Yeah, which 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 is insane. And I love how you you spend a lot of time focusing on all of the micronutrients to ensure that someone gets as much like micronutrients as they can within a day, so they actually like wake up with energy and feel real good. I love that how you know the, the vertical diet isn't all just about you know like muscle building and stuff too it's like hitting the micronutrients in order to get like as much yeah. energy and body function as possible and that's still performance i mean if you go to the gym and have energy you're going to train harder the cumulative effect of that over time is, is certainly going to be better performance outcomes so uh i did discover that there were certain foods that were pretty rich in micronutrients that just made you feel better you had more stamina and endurance at the gym and you could just do more work and, and recover faster uh so i stuck with uh with those foods it's it's not really an if it fits your macros kind of diet. If it's it, it, it's an if it fits your micros kind of diet to, yeah. to start, at least until you've built the foundation. And I just found that myself and so many people that tried it were like, hey, I have more energy. And that's a win. That's a big win. Yeah, a really big win. Like <laughs> so many people are craving for that now because I find that just, you know, 2021 stress is like the main thing that's coming in. And we want to like defeat that and overcome it. And like eating yeah. a diet like, like yours is definitely helping people to get through that. Yeah. And I discussed that, I think, in the, in the book and the diet as well, stress. And I have that video, that YouTube video about stress for success, right? You know, there's some foundational principles and, and I don't want to get into, you know, the psychiatry of the whole thing or the psychology of the whole thing. I, I just think the foundation of battling stress, as I, as I mentioned in the rant, is, is uh, you know, sleep, exercise and nutrition. And if you abandon any of those three things, you're, you're going to be weaker to manage the stress because you can't eliminate stress. I, I spoke about the fact that you don't really want to because the more successful you are, the more stress you're going to endure. and You have to be strong enough to manage that. And the, the strength comes from, uh, you know, having those foundational, foundational principles, uh, you know, the, the sleep hydration, and, uh, nutrition and exercise. So just simple things like getting your seven plus hours, taking your 10 minute walks after meals and eating again, you know, you're just not eating like an asshole. I guess we can summarize <laughs> in such a way. Uh, then you're, you know, you're just, you're just stronger to deal with the stress that you have because there's really no way to minimize the stress. And I, I liken it to lifting. If, if you can only bench 100 and there's 200 on the bar and somebody gives you a lift off, you're going to get crushed by it. Yeah. But if you bench press 300 and there's 200 on the bar, you're doing reps. And that's my whole idea with stress is just make yourself strong enough so that it's manageable uh, for you. Yeah, true. And definitely having a micronutrient rich diet can definitely help that. And I know your book's out and I know everyone can um, like um, get your book because that's, that's launched, hasn't it? Yes, oh, it has. Like, yeah, yes, number one uh, new release on Amazon, three weeks Boom. running. Yeah, yeah, I love that so yeah. much. So people can obviously get your book if they want to find the vertical diet. But for anyone who's like for new listeners, because a lot of people um, who are listening obviously know who you are, but a lot of new listeners may be like, what's actually, what are the foods in the vertical diet? Like what what sort of stuff in there do, do I eat to make myself feel better? Would you mind just giving a quick explanation? Yeah, you know, I build a foundation of micronutrient-dense foods that are highly bioavailable and easy to digest, as we discussed. And, uh, you know, I want you to get a gram of protein per pound of body weight or at least pound of goal weight or lean weight if you're significantly overweight. And that, uh, you know, and those come from a variety of protein sources that have a, a lot of micronutrients in them. I think it's kind of the anti-diet. And I'll, I'll start by saying that, that I went through a long career, as you know, of uh, working with people in the bodybuilding figure physique bikini industry. Uh, and it's gotten worse since social media. 
uh, people restricting foods, important foods, like uh, you go to a, a guru diet or nutrition person to get ready for a show and they'll tell you, hey, eliminate red meat, eliminate whole eggs, eliminate fruit, eliminate dairy, eliminate salt. Those are all the things I start with. I could get somebody <laughs> into amazing shape. It's a calorie equation at the end of the day, but hunger and energy are going to dictate your ability to comply with that diet. And all of the, the satiating foods and all the energy comes from things like red meat, like dairy, like fruit, uh, like whole eggs and like sodium. And so I actually build my protein foundation on those foods. I'll use a leaner meat. You know, I trained Nadia Wyatt, who took third place in the Miss Olympia two years in a row. And she dieted for the whole show uh, as the foundation was red meat and whole eggs. Uh, we just took her from, say, a New York steak for five months out to a top sirloin four months out to a, uh, a sirloin tip or top round as we got closer to the show and then went to a grass fed or like a Piedmontese beef, which is uh, very, very low fat. And so we just looked at, we just brought the fat content down. And the reason that I do that is because I want to leave plenty of room for carbohydrates for performance because ultimately your ability to gain or maintain muscle tissue is going to be dependent upon uh, the amount of workload that you can maintain or sustain throughout this diet period. And, uh, you know, the sets and reps and the, the volume that you can lift, as soon as that starts declining, you're going to start losing muscle tissue. So I'm holding onto that for dear life. And I find that, uh, that fueling that with carbohydrates is the best way in terms of performance. So uh, I include a, a whole egg or two, even if you're going to blend it with, you know, two eggs and two egg whites. Uh, you know, if you want to start bringing fat down, you can do that. But I don't eliminate them because uh, the egg yolk's full of biotin, which is great for skin, hair, and nails. And too many of these dieting females end up with brittle hair and, and their skin uh, and nails suffering from, from the, the diet. And, uh, red meat in particular, because a lot of these dieters end up with anemia. And we, you know, the iron is important. Uh, the B vitamins, of course, the zinc is all significantly in greater quantities uh, than in, say, even chicken or turkey. Uh, so it's, it's a superior source. I'm not saying that chicken and turkey can't be used in a diet, but certainly don't exclude red meat because it's a superior micronutrient source. So I keep that in there. And then uh, the fruit's huge uh, for energy as well. I don't know why people uh, even begin to, uh, you know, to, to restrict fruits. It's fantastic. It uh, helps uh, fructose in particular. People shy away from in, in uh, small quantities, you know, less than 50 grams a day. Uh, through fruit it helps with your energy a lot. It helps with your health. Uh, it helps with converting uh, T4 into T3, uh, the inactive to active form in the liver of, of thyroid function. And, uh, you know, thyroid's another big thing. So we throw a little iodine in the diet through some cranberry juice or iodized salt instead of sea salt, which has no iodine in it, uh, because we see that uh, hypothyroidism is common in dieters. And that's going to cause that brittle hair to start falling out and your energy to to a decline in your body temperature to, to get colder. As you see, a lot of people with dieting for shows end up uh, getting a lower body temperature, get cold all the time, have to wear sweaters. A lot of that has to do with thyroid function. And we know how important that is for metabolism and calorie consumption. So uh, we include all those foods. And then dairy, really important for calcium, not just for bones, but also for nerve signaling and for muscle fiber contraction. And people who can't handle lactose, we can get them to a, you know, a, a Greek yogurt. It's very low in lactose, plus it has digestive enzymes. About 90 plus percent of the population can tolerate certain amounts of that kind of, again, it's quantity dose dependent at that point, but I, I keep all of that in the diet and I just have athletes that they're healthier, longer, obviously the last 30 days before a show all, you know, you pull out all the stops and it's, uh, I've said it in a, in a rant once, I think it was, um, if you want to be healthy, don't compete. And I mentioned <laughs> that, uh, you know, that fitness and health are two different things. Yeah. And, you know, the ability to perform a particular duty or task, which is your fitness level, uh, you know, might not always be healthy. And that's true of a 400 pound strong man, as well as it's true of a, uh, you know, of a 14 year old gymnast at the Olympics uh, suffering from, you know, Achilles tendon tears and, uh, and, and those kinds of things. So anybody who's competing knows you're going to, you're, you're going to have at some level, you're going to be uh, compromising health. And so the diet in particular helps to mitigate some of that. And I use obviously frequent blood tests to to see what people are, uh, you know, what kind of um, problems are manifesting over the course of competition, which I, I did on a monthly basis for well over 12 years throughout uh, the peak of my competitive career. So uh, those are all things that are important. So the foundation of the diet, uh, you know, really from, is a variety of protein sources, as just mentioned. Um, and then I'm going to uh, obviously try and include some 
uh, fruits and vegetables, which are in that foundation. Potassium is a big component of that, a daily potatoes, twice the potassium as a banana. I get some spinach in there and some fruit and yogurt and even meat has 100 milligrams of potassium for every ounce. And so that builds the foundation as well. And I don't really need to add fats. They're in the egg yolks. They're in the meat. They're in the salmon. A couple, couple servings of salmon a week. Salmon has 200 times the omega-3s of any other meat source, uh, such as beef or chicken or turkey. And so, you know, two servings of that a week, two five-ounce servings, get you your two grams of EPA and DHA that you need every week. Uh, and then from there, if I have to fuel more performance, if I have, a say, a two-a-day CrossFitter or a football player preseason or a, like a Hofthor Bjornsson and you just need more calories, then I got to support that with carbohydrates. And uh, I can throw in a little bit of oatmeal here and there. I can throw in a little bit of bread or a little bit of pasta, but not a lot because it you'll start to, to get gassy and bloated on that. So I try and drive that performance with white rice. That's, that's how I fuel the, the, the glycogen needs for those uh, very active or very big athletes to support their muscle mass and get the caloric demand that they require. Because uh, white rice is so easy to digest and then you can consume more of it sooner and, and you don't get all bloated and gassy and you can perform well on it. So that's, that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts of the nutrition part of the diet. And as you know, the vertical diet is much more than that. We cover sleep, hydration, digestion, blood testing, you know, a whole host of different th variables that are important uh, as part of a, you know, well-rounded program. Yeah, but I love that because anyone who listens just immediately is just going to take like a whole bunch of nuggets out of that. Like, whoa, whoa, obviously to <laughs> yeah. start on, on their journey. Have you got any like stories yeah. that have sort of like, because you've been helping a lot of people. Have you got any stories that like tug on the heartstrings a little bit that you've been like, man, this was just so good that we learned this stuff and, and put all of these things through. Yeah, a lot of results. them. I mean, just everybody I deal with that, that you know, and, and some of them are bittersweet. You know, I was training Hofthor Bjornsson and Brian Shaw at the same time. Yeah. And you know, so you, it's like the, the thrill of victory, agony, defeat. You know, Hofthor would win, Brian would take second, and, and you, you know, so you're kind of torn. Uh, you love all your athletes equally, and, uh, you know, you want them all to succeed. So, uh, but more than anything, you know, I think I, I mentioned the digestion. Uh, Brian Shaw had a lot of problems eating enough food. So did or, you know, anybody who's power lifted or a big athlete, even Lane Johnson, the Philadelphia Eagles, is 330 pounds now. He was having trouble maintaining 312. And he was eating like chicken and quinoa. And he was, he was just giving up. And he reached out to me, and, and it's the same story with a lot of power lifters, uh, big football players, strong men, uh, weight gaining athletes. When they utilize the tips and tricks that I just mentioned, um, then their, their digestion's better. Brian reached out to me a week after being on the diet and said, Stan, he said, I'm hungry. I haven't been hungry in years because these guys are forced feeding themselves around the clock. And then also, you know, I mentioned diarrhea and all, you know. Just the kind of things that that uh, that you endure as a as a big athlete that's sucking down six, seven, eight thousand calories a day, that uh, uh, that is unnecessary. You can change your diet, and fix that problem, but we'll you know we'll power through anything if we have to. And the same thing's true on the opposite end. I don't want to make this sound exclusively about big athletes. Uh, I mentioned Nadia Wyatt, who was only 123 pounds on the Olympia stage. And, uh, I worked with Tiny Tiff, who was 103 pounds. I worked with a, uh, a Sacramento uh, ballet company dancer who was 97 pounds. And I worked with a lot of soccer moms who want to lose weight. And what they find is, is that, again, they have more energy and less digestive issues when they eat the particular foods that I recommend because they provide, uh, you know, that micronutrient base for energy and they're pretty satiating. And uh, uh, I should probably mention that the, the vertical diet is used by both uh, you know, tiny Tiff at 100 pounds and Hofthor Bjornsson at 440. But there's some there's some different things that I do. They have the same foundations, the same diet, the same micronutrient dense foods, the same red meat, uh, the same fruit, the same dairy, uh, all of those, those things that are in the foundation of the diet, the same potassium, uh, but in different quantities. So when people are dieting, I need to manage hunger. One of the ways that I do that in particular, I'll just give you like three or four top tips uh, for satiety in general. So I've got a dieter. I want him to, to, to cook and cut and chew steak because it just takes more time. Mechanically speaking, it takes a little longer to digest. So you're not as hungry. Uh, you get full sooner and not hungry as, as quickly. Um, and I'll use uh, uh, fruits instead of fruit juice. Fruits are high satiety. Potatoes, boiled potatoes. There's an index that ranks foods for how satiating they are. And potatoes and, and oranges are at the top of that list. And then we'll throw in some fiber, although there is some uh, suspicion or, or I, 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 let me just say that 
the literature does not isn't as convincing uh, as to the satiety effects of fiber as it is to protein. Uh, fibers, more than anything, uh, it takes a while to eat a salad, and so the t it's time, uh, and it, it stretches out and fills the stomach. And so, while it, it may satiate you at that meal, the the duration of time with which it satiates you is not as significant as protein. So. We go with a high protein diet. A dieter, I might put on 1.2 grams per pound. Uh, have to eat a lot of proteins. It's very satiating. There's very high thermic effect of foods. I mean, they're netting out fewer calories than uh, than they would uh, with a you know a protein or a, or, or a carbohydrate or a fat. So there's not a lot left to work with after that. Once we get them a higher protein, uh, you know, a, a protein source that's that takes longer to chew and, and digest, uh, and then get them some high satiety foods and a little bit of uh, say salad, uh, you're about done. And, and, and from there, you just want to want to keep hunger minimized as much as possible so that it's, uh, you know, you can battle through what you need to for the time period that you're losing weight, switch gears over to the weight gainers. And I'll bring their protein down to 0.8 grams per pound of body weight, because in a calorie surplus, uh, you know, cal carbs in particular are protein sparing. You don't need as much protein and it's very satiating. So you don't want to recommend that to somebody who has to suck down a lot of calories. And I'll use this, say, a ground meat source like a bison uh, and, and because it's a little easier to consume more of it and digest it a little faster. It has more surface area. And I'll mix it with some white rice and some bone broth, as you know, the monster mash. It's just easier to eat more of it in a sitting without feeling like you're you know, swallowing you know, all this food. And then it digests faster and you're hungry again sooner. Another tip and trick I'll use is I'll use a little bit of juice instead of oranges. I'll use a little orange juice, maybe three or four ounces, not a ton. Uh, really helps, again, with body temperature and heat and metabolism. And, uh, you're just hungry again sooner. I have a video called 14 Tips uh, to Improve Your Appetite. It talks about this. And, um, and it's just really, it's not necessarily a way to drive calories. It's just a way to keep your, your, uh, your body temperature, keep your body, uh, your metabolism cooking so that you're hungry. And then white rice, I mentioned. I, I keep the fiber a little lower if they're trying to gain mass because it's harder to eat and, you, and you know, get a lot of calories out of it. But the white rice, and I use a little trick. I, I sprinkle a little dextrose on it. Uh, and it's not to drive calories. It's just, to, again, more amylase, more saliva. Um, and so you can eat more of it faster with, without mm. choking it down. Uh, I like mixing it in with the bone broth and the beef and the egg because, again, because of the moistness of the bone broth, it's just easier to eat a lot of it. But sometimes you'll have to add an extra cup of rice uh, and sprinkling the dextrose on it makes it easier to consume more of it. You're, uh, there is uh, some suggestion that the pancreas can release more amylase, which helps digest the starch as a result of the dextrose stimulation, uh, you know, the larger bolus of starch from the rice. And so then again, you, you can eat more of it. You're, you're uh, hungry again sooner and you can eat again, which frequency becomes pretty important when you know, you're trying to bring down a lot of calories rather than huge volumes in any one meal that might just make you lethargic, and, uh, keep you full for a long period of time. I keep the fats low. Uh, I'm sure I got you. I'm sorry, I had a call come in. I keep the fats low down around 0.4 grams per pound. I do that with both dieters and weight gainers. So I just fats beyond that, which provide you a health benefit really don't contribute to performance. And so I, I, I don't need to drive those uh, very hard and, and 0.4 grams per pound is plenty to get the health benefit from those. Uh, and you do need fats in the diet. Of course, it's going to support hormonal function. It's going to support transporting ADE and K out of, in and out of the cells. It's, it's a lot of important reasons to keep fats at a reasonable level. So uh, you don't lose hormonal function. So, I think that pretty much wraps up both ends of that weight loss and weight gain the strategy that I use. Um, yeah, for, you just dropped so many actual practical tools and tips just there. Yeah. What to, how to do. I actually, like, big thanks for that because a lot of people get a lot out of it. It's one thing that as listeners are like, what, what are some practical tools and tips that we can have? And you just yeah. lay down like 40. <laughs> yeah, and those are all, they all work, man. I got to tell you, I've gained and lost well over a thousand pounds throughout my career. I was 140 pounds when I was in college at 18 years old. And, I, you know, I bulked up at one point in, by 1994 to over 300 pounds. And I've been dieting down to, to compete at 4% body fat in, as a pro bodybuilder and bulking up to, you know, 285, 290 
back and forth many, many, many times over 25 plus years of competing. So, you know, I have a lot of experience. I did a lot of things wrong. I learned a lot of these lessons decades ago before the science supported it uh, by just making the same mistakes over and over again. <laughs> I was doing the go mad, you know, the gallon of milk a day, the whole milk and the big cheese pizzas and, and all that. I did all that. I got fat as fuck. <laughs> and my, 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 you know, my blood test showed it too. All of that. <laughs> I said, this know. cholesterol is no good. <laughs> it, it was terrible. Yeah, you get insulin resistance and fatty liver, and you know, you get high blood pressure and AST, ALT enzymes go skyrocketing, and all the things I see in my big athletes. And then when dieting, you know, I, I tried the keto thing over and over again. I was persistent. I, I and I, every single time I got weaker and I got smaller, and uh, you know, I suffered more in terms of. Uh, of uh, uh, hormone uh, dips and it was just a terrible experience so uh, I, I've been there I've done that many many times and I just I feel like I've, I found the path of least resistance and that's not to say that you can't use any of those diets and get in the same condition what I'm saying is is that that, that the, the road doesn't have to be that as difficult you'll be hungrier longer your your blood work will, will be worse uh, the recovery will be worse. Uh, I, I just, I just, I think I've kind of just made the recommendations I've made, so that just make it a little, a, a little bit easier on the athlete in terms of, of just uh, going through what is already a difficult yeah. challenge, you know, on either end of the spectrum. Yeah, instead of having to make all of those mistakes themselves and constantly, you know, get down, get back up again, get down, get back up again. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, big respect to you, um, Stan, because. Man, you've maintained like one of the most ridiculous physiques I've ever seen. Like your body's insane. And obviously, I was, I'd like to ask you the question. And you've done it for like a, for a long period of time. And you're, you've optimized and you're always in good moods and high spirits from what I've seen. <laughs> obviously, it's hard to maintain that. 10 out of 10 all the time yeah but man i'd love to ask you sort of how you do it i know the logical answer is i follow the vertical diet and i train really hard <laughs> yeah <laughs> but is there anything else in terms of like you know actually what keeps you motivated and what other tips and tricks and tools have you got to uh, maintain that because i see a lot of people who are like even in their 40s and are approaching 50s who sort of stop um like stop lifting stop trying to focus on diet and, and health and stuff so i'd love to know how you do yeah. it because i want let to me maintain unpack that. Some of that i want to maintain that as i get older man well there's a lot there and let me let me jump on a few things one i did start competing back in 1986 and so i have been at this a long long time uh i first total elite total over 2,000 pounds in 1993 and uh i was you know 2300 in 2015 or 2014 uh, if I recall, so Whoa. for well over 20 years, you know, I was I was getting elite totals for well over 20 years. That's powerlifting and, for anyone lifting. That's strong. Yeah, <laughs> it's really strong. And I had some bumps and bruises along the way. Yeah. I certainly suffered from a few muscle tears here and there, and some tendonitis. And I've talked at length about that. Uh, and that's kind of the if you want to be healthy, don't compete kind of thing. You know, that's just it's what you put your body through to 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 win. And that uh, there's really no getting around that. But one thing I did have to do uh, after I retired from powerlifting is I kind of I kind of had to redefine myself. You can't. I tried for a while. You can't continue to go in and crush yourself like that when you're 45, 48, 53, like I am now. I have hard workouts, but I don't do nearly as much volume of heavy stuff. And heavy is all relative because I don't squat. 800 plus anymore. I, I'm probably down around 600 now with no knee wraps. That's too and crazy. Well, yeah, it's a lot, but I don't do it very often, and I only do it when my body feels good about it. Um, but I pick a lot of exercises that don't hurt as much. And one of the things that we do, even what we do with John Jones, he's John's a fighter. He's got it. He's got ten workouts a week, and some of them include, uh, you know, martial arts. He's got wrestling. He's got jujitsu. He's got kickboxing, uh, Muay Thai, and some of them are us. We got to do some hypertrophy training. We got to do some endurance training. We got to do some. Uh, uh, obviously some speed work and some strength work. And so he's got a lot of volume. So we try and do low fatigue workouts, meaning mostly concentric movements with him. Uh, you know, that'd be like squats out of change, you know, just doing the concentric portion and dropping them down. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with John that, that helps him recover from workouts, such as sled drags, maybe ATP marches that uh, just a cable 
squat, you know, a belt squat machine. You march on it, just pumping a lot of blood into his body, and keeping him moving a lot. And that was one of the things I discovered late. Uh, yeah, it probably wasn't until after I met um, uh, Louis Simmons and talked to some of the uh, people who have trained in that with that style is that they did a lot of volume, uh, which I did almost accidentally by competing in two sports. Remember, I competed in bodybuilding and then I competed in powerlifting. So I had enormous amount of volume and frequency through bodybuilding, through a lot of different angles. Uh, uh, with, with, you know, short rest periods, ton of volume. Uh, my cardiovascular fitness was extraordinary. And that would, that would carry over into my powerlifting. My health was better. I had no weaknesses. Uh, I would recover faster. Uh, it's when I started powerlifting more and bodybuilding less that I actually feel like I got a little worse because it's, I just didn't have enough of the foundation, the GPP, the general physical preparedness, the, the, the cardio that's gained from all that volume, the maintenance of, of uh, muscle mass can that, that can actually decline with less volume and more heavy singles and doubles and triples. You lose size and, and uh, you know, a larger muscle could be a stronger muscle when trained appropriately, but you have to maintain that mass. And so purely by accident, by going back and forth between bodybuilding and powerlifting, uh, I think most of my powerlifting success was a result of having built so much muscle mass and being in such great condition and having uh, no weaknesses because we trained everything from such, such a variety of angles. And now that I'm older, I just make sure and move a lot. I, I do less of the heavy stuff, but I continue to move a lot. You've all heard me talk about the 10 minute walks or I'll have a recumbent bike in my garage or house. And, uh, I do that religiously. I've been doing that for 10 years or 12 years. I talked about getting one in my hotel room when I trained with Mark Bell in 2009. And I was doing three 10 minute uh, bicycles, recumbent bikes a day. Uh, just to help recover from the heavy squat sessions. Uh, and my DOMS was minimized. Uh, I you know, had just dramatic recovery improvement from doing that, just three, 10 minutes a day. And so now I, I still do that. I still do a lot of volume. Uh, all, I only show the, sometimes I only show the heavy sets because uh, that's Instagram. <laughs> yeah. But I do a lot of wimpy stuff. I'll put a sled on and drag a sled around and I'll do marches on the ATP. And I'll ride my little bicycle for 10 minutes, three times a day, religiously, uh, or take my walks if I'm traveling or go to the little fitness center at the hotel and, and ride my bike 15 minutes after the meal, which, you know, I've talked about the fact that it helps with digestion. It helps with blood sugar control. Uh, you can decrease postprandial glycemia, the, the blood sugar elevation and duration by up to 30%. Just taking a 10 minute walk, 15 minutes after a meal, it's twice as effective as metformin for preventing or reversing type two diabetes. That's why you see Brian Shaw and Hofthor taking 10 minute walks. It's great for their appetite. It's great for their blood sugar for guys that are that weight. That's one of your primary concerns is insulin resistance, fatty liver, metabolic syndrome. And so we, you know, that was the, one of the, the initial interventions that, that I introduced and I did the same thing with John. And I, I remember the first conversation I had with him on the phone, the long dead air when I told him he was going to take a 10 minute walk after each of four <laughs> meals daily. I, it was just silence. And I realized he's like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we all do it. And, it, and it. and he knows now what a big contributor it is, not just to recover from, but prepare for the next training session, uh, not just from the blood flow to the muscles, but also from the improvements in digestion and blood sugar maintenance. So, uh, those little things which sound like little things are the things that I do religiously. And that's where we get to compliance is the science. The consistency is what's key. And if you want to know what, what maybe is different about me than a lot of other folks is that I do this, this mon what might seem like monotonous, boring stuff every single day without mm. fail. To me, it's a habit now. I, I don't eat without walking. I just don't do it. Never. I love that compliance as a science saying that you come up with. It's just so true. Like keeping consistent, yeah. all of those things every single day, they always just add up and it's, it's easy to fall off the routine and, um, but it's, it's easy to jump back on it as well. Sometimes I definitely think what, what, Indeed. Would, you, yeah, what would you say to someone who is sort of, you know, sort of started to have some success in their life or they've started to feel a little bit comfortable and they're like, all right, I'm at this position now to start investing in myself because I want to make myself better. What are some of the things, obviously logical answer, get on the vertical diet as well, but what are some of the um, things that you would encourage them to invest on so, uh, so they can improve the quality of their life? 
Yeah, you know, it's going to be the big rocks again. Get your seven plus hours of sleep. And, and I have a whole sleep hygiene chapter in there where I talk about, you know, a dark room, a quiet room, a cool room, uh, you know, the blue light management, uh, the worry journal at night, just kind of offloading all the, the, you know, the stuff that's going on onto a piece of paper. It's kind of a little to-do list for the next day. Uh, those are the big, big things. And then just affording yourself an opportunity to be successful. Most people just don't even get into bed until midnight and have to get up at 6 a.m. That, that right there. Uh, you, know, you cannot be successful. And so at least give yourself that eight hour window uh, and then ditching the phone becomes probably the next biggest challenge. Uh, <laughs> if, you go to bed at, if you go to bed at 10 o'clock and you're scrolling through Instagram or watching you know, a podcast and next thing you know, it's 1130 anyhow. And, and that's, a, that's a loser. So, you know, ditch the phone, get the sleep. The seven plus hours is the foundation of everything. You, you, you know, no diet, no exercise program is going to supersede the, uh, you know, all the problems that come yeah. from uh, the lack of sleep, you're just tired and you brain fog and uh, it, you're just not going to be successful. So that's the big yeah. one. And I'm really religious about that, setting up the environment. And that means no pets in the bed, you know, because they move around. Even the kids, I'm like, look, you know, I got legs tomorrow. You guys got to sleep in your own bed. <laughs> <laughs> if it's leg day like, tomorrow, you're in your own bed. <laughs> yeah, and they already know. They're used to it now. I'm just like, they're like they even asked me, hey, dad, is tomorrow leg day? Because they want to sleep with mom. And dad, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Oh, my kids, we love our children and they, they just love to be with us. But, you know, my son in particular, he, he, he can't go five minutes without flip flopping around and making these horrendous noises in the middle of the night. That's not a night's sleep, you know, a, a disturbed <laughs> sleep. Uh, or even sleep apnea. If you don't get a CPAP and remedy, uh, you know, you're holding your breath at night. And the quality of your sleep is, is horrendous. And I talk a lot about that in the, in the program as well. So uh, sleep's the big one, obviously. Uh, the 10-minute walks are easy. You don't have to do any more cardio than that. I'm not a huge cardio fan. And, and, and you see from, if you watch social media, you see everybody's kind of coming away from that. The whole 40 minutes on the treadmill every night in the gym. It's not terribly sustainable. It's not very effective. We don't see that, that uh, more cardio equals more weight loss. It's, it's good for your health, uh, but you can get the same health benefits from three 10-minute walks. And they're convenient. They're sustainable. You know, they can fit your schedule. They do so much more. And we know that moving three times a day is better than moving one. We see that in research on uh, all, you know, all-cause mortality from uh, sedentary office workers that uh, moving around uh, frequently throughout the day is better than doing 30 minutes of cardio at the end of the yeah. day. So 10 minute walks are easy. You know, and, and a lot of the stuff I talked about, even then now we're down to meal prep, uh, get a company to send you your meals and just take that, take that out of your worries. You know, uh, you just pop them into your, your microwave and you're done. It's all done for you. You save time, you save money. They're right there when you need it. Even when I'm working from home and I'm making a big breakfast, uh, my breakfast is always monster mash. I'm just making bison, <laughs> scrap, egg whites, and, and uh, you know, some, some, uh, some, uh, some bone broth. broth. Yeah. But I make three, and I'll eat one, and I'll put two in the thermos, and I just set them on the on, on the, the windowsill or on the kitchen counter. And and now it doesn't matter. I've got my meals are already done. I, I, all I got to worry about now is dinner. And you know, if I've got to go pick the kids up at school, and then they've got to go to you know some after school events or whatever. You, I just grab my meal and take it with me in the car and I never have to worry about, you know, detouring to Carl's Jr. or some other crap, that, uh, you know, that derails your progress. So, and I eat the food I enjoy that feels good on me, like we've discussed. And so, uh, you know, meal prepping is a huge one. It does save me a ton of time. Uh, just, if you think about just pulling over and stopping, even in the subway, you know, it, it, it just takes you more time than if you've already got something sitting there ready for you. And particularly yeah. if you go to a restaurant, you know, that's 40 minutes of your day soaked up just to get one meal that you can be done with in six minutes you know, in the car while you're waiting for your kids to, to do whatever they're doing. So I, I know it, it, it sounds probably overly rigid, but it frees up more time for me to do the things that I like doing, like spending the time with my kids. And I'm not running around trying to fill my belly, uh, you know, and spending more time and money on that. So I'm big on uh, I'm doing things that, that free up free time for me. That's why I tore out all the grass. Of course, I live in, in Vegas, but I tore out all the grass and put in turf and then <laughs> rocks. So now I don't have to mow the freaking lawn. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I found the, the place that had like a monthly uh, membership for car washes. So now I don't have to wash my car. I just go up there and run it. <laughs> the just car wash, you know. Offloading all the extra stress to have the I have do. Time. I, yeah. I, just, I just try and get rid of everything that, that – takes my time that I don't really want that, that, that I don't enjoy. Uh, I just, I just made a list and I just figure out how do I outsource this? Yeah. Even grocery shopping. I, I love to go to Costco, you know, periodically, but 
I'm, I end up there three times a week because I got a big family. My pops lives with me and my three kids and my wife and uh, her sister and nieces come over all the time. And, and so uh, I'm usually at Costco a lot. So I just called up uh, uh, Instacart and send them the list. And next thing you know, the groceries are at my door, you know, cost you 20 bucks, big deal. You know, it's just little things like that that give me time. I even, and this starts to get down into, uh, you know, really nitpicking, but you know, a lot of successful guys talk about um, uh, how they swear the same thing every day, uh, which is, isn't hard for me because I just got my, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all I got the, in my yeah, closet. You get, the, get vocal good stuff, yeah. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm traveling back and forth to, to Albuquerque, so I'll stay out there for five days and I'll come home for, for nine and then I'll alternate because John trains Monday through Friday, so I'm with him one week and then my my partner, uh, Matt Whitmer out of beat training in Cincinnati comes out that we alternate weeks so we can be with our families. Mm -hmm. And so I just set myself up completely down there with all the same stuff. So I'm not even hauling clothes back and forth. I got socks down there. I got underwear down there. I got shorts down there. I just got two of everything. I got my, my shaving kit down there and one at home. I got two of everything, but, uh, <laughs> even at home, I, you know, I, I'm the, I'm the kind of guy, if I open the dryer, and this is, this is going to get really neurotic. But if I open the dryer and there's my clothes, my wife's clothes, and the kids' clothes in there, my brain's just like, Psh. I got the attention span of a gnat. I can do 10 things at once, but if you ask me to do one thing that takes 10 minutes, I'm lost. I just, I just, I, I'm just like, you know. So I open the dryer up and there's like four people's worth of clothes in there. Shit I don't even recognize. I don't know where it goes. I'm just like, forget it. You take care of it. So I wash my own, I wash my own clothes. So I know exactly what's in there by themselves. And then they're all the same. You know, I don't, I have only one type of sock. I have only one type of underwear. I have only one type of short that I wear, you know, just a couple different colors maybe. And I have the same damn t-shirt. I wear the same thing every day. And to me, it's just, it takes all of those other little thoughts out of your head. So you can focus on the big things. There's, yeah. there's major decisions that you have to make every day that uh, are important for your bottom line for success. And if you keep getting bogged down with a whole bunch of these other little niggling things that most people probably think I'm crazy, but uh, it, it just it just occupies, it just takes up too much of my brain energy for the day to make these little decisions that I I, I don't have the time nor need uh, to make. And so I'm I'm pretty pretty freaking organized and, and consistent. <laughs> I like to repeat the same behaviors every day. It's like Groundhog Day. So those are the behaviors that I found to be successful. And so I just keep doubling down on this. What keeps you motivated, Stan? What really keeps you going? I, I've just always been really, really passionate about bodybuilding and powerlifting and nutrition. I, I spent my whole I spent 30 years, you know, traveling the world and spending tens of thousands of dollars in no shortage of time. I studied it in college. I, I was a coach, you know, obviously I was a high school soccer coach and I coached uh, University of Oregon football players, and track athletes. Of course, I competed for 25 years. During that time, I was... Uh, trying to reach out to some of the best coaches I could find. I think everybody should have a coach. I work with some of the best gurus in the business. Uh, Eddie Cohn, and obviously Flex Wheeler, Mark Bell, and, uh, all the other names uh, that, that you can imagine in the industry. I've worked with them or collaborated or communicated with them over over the years. And now more of the academics. You know, I've recruited Damon McCune, who's a PhD RDN, to be the co-author of my book. And so we've spent hundreds of hours together just sifting through everything that uh, – that I, I feel like I've compiled over the years to make sure it, it, uh, it bumps up against the science well. And, uh, you know, I follow a lot of the, uh, the great minds in the industry, I think, the people who are both uh, competitive and, uh, you know, academically um, uh, accredited, uh, the Greg Knuckles of the world from Mass Research Review, the Lane Nortons of the world, um, you know, Brad Schoenfeld and his, his, uh, and his research on hypertrophy and Brett Contreras and Dr. Andy Galpin. The list goes on and on and on. I'm jealous. Uh, oh, we're just, I mean, so we're, we're just so lucky. You know, when I started this, this whole adventure, there was no internet. And I just had to listen to the meathead behind the gym, behind the counter at Gold's, who was eating tuna out of a can and rice cakes. And I thought that was what, you know, that's what I started doing. It's no wonder I wasn't, you know, I, I, it took me so damn long to, to build an appreciable mass or, or strength it, 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 i was fumbling around doing all the wrong shit so uh nowadays we're just overwhelmed with so much great information and, oh. uh, there's there's crappy information out there too but i think that, that for the most part well i'll have to qualify it by saying this for the most part we started to see the cream rise to the top and then tiktok happened. <laughs> 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 and now all the freaking 
all the charlatans are back, you know, oh, with their man. little 30 seconds of nonsense. And so it, it's, it, it's like, it'll never end. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you're doing a good job, man, and you've been working with the best people and literally the, the greatest minds, man. It's just, and because you're doing such good like work, obviously you get rewarded with you know being able to do all these amazing things. Yeah, I'm quite jealous, Stan. You're doing like it was real good work, and it's it's just it's so awesome to see. And thanks for bringing it all to the forefront. Thank you. And you know, I'm still learning. I'm learning a lot. I I went and back and took some courses. I went and got my uh, 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 NSCA's uh, CSCS. Uh, certified strength and conditioning coach uh I've, I've attended seminars for you know a lot of the great minds barbell medicine is another one that comes to mind I attended their seminar and mark ripito's seminar uh you know i'm constantly learning and reading and, and i'm a gentlemen. member to alan aragon's research research review he's a fantastic uh, mind in the nutrition space and of course uh, mass research review with greg knuckles from stronger by science so i mean i'm constantly reading i probably spend at least four or five hours Yes, I'm still learning. I've said plenty of stupid oh, no, shit over the years. I look back at some of my old videos and I cringe. <laughs> if, if, if not, entirety, but it, uh, maybe at, at, at least, uh, you know, I just feel like I'm, uh, I'm making strides even at, after all these years of, of doing everything I've done. I, there's still more to learn. And, uh, there's great people out there to learn it from. And at the end of the day, I did it. You know, uh, I, I achieved a lot. And I think so I have a, a lot to say and share about that. But that's my anecdote. And then uh, the athletes that I work with, of course, is, is our testimonials. Uh, but at the end of the day, you really have to make sure that, that the science uh, bears out and that I'm not making recommendations that are, that are inconsistent with what you know, the, the studies show us. Yeah, for sure. And I, I bet you've got to love every single time that you, uh, you learn something new or so there's a new study that comes out or anything and it just backs up the vertical diet and you're like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I knew it. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. <laughs> No, nah, that's so good. Well, Stan, man, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Thank you for sharing like, all of your wisdom and stuff. If anyone wants to find you or grab your book and you know, start optimizing their lives, where should they go? Everything's at Stan Efforting. StanEfforting.com is my website. You can link to my meal prep company. We deliver nationwide in the U.S. And, uh, and we, uh, uh, I've got the Vertical Diet 3.0 ebook on there. Uh, I just released the Vertical Diet book on Amazon. But the only difference between the two is that the ebook is something I update periodically, hence version 3.0, and I've got working on the 4.0 now. And it takes a little deeper dive into the training and into the um, uh, some of the uh, HRT stuff, the blood testing uh, and stuff like that. It's a little more comprehensive uh, and, and more specific for some athletes, whereas the book is kind of for general population. But they're both great. Some people like to, you know, to hold on to something and have it to highlights and to take notes of and keep in their bookshelf. So those are both out there. And then Instagram's at Stan Efforting and uh, YouTube, a lot of great videos on YouTube. My rants, yeah. I spent a lot of time preparing those and writing those. And, uh, and th those are YouTube Stan Efforting as well. So everything can be found there. No, well, thank you so much for sharing, man. And thanks for all the good knowledge and stuff. And for everyone listening, I hope you got some notes down in this and, uh, and got something really valuable because I definitely did. So big thank you. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having me on, man.